James grinned as the familiar noise of the door opening resounded through the lab. He was perched down, slightly to his right, patiently waiting for it to open and for the people standing behind it to enter. His grin widened as he saw the first slender foot peek through the opening, followed first by a long leg, and then bit by bit by the rest of Sheeta's body. As she tried to carefully sneak in, her eyes alertly searched the room, presumably for him. However, she didn't seem to have discovered him, pressed slightly against the wall right next to her. As she took another tentative step into the supposedly empty lab, James quietly took a deep breath through his nose, his grin widening even more. He waited for her to take just one more step before quietly moving in her direction. But apparently, he wasn't quiet enough, for as soon as he had moved, her ears slightly twitched and she started turning towards him. It did not do her any good, because the second James noticed her turning, he sprang into action. Catapulting himself forward, he burst out of his position, letting out a shout and shooting his hands upward, and it worked like a charm. With a shriek like hiss, Sheeda flung herself backwards, launching multiple meters into the air in the process. James laughed uncontrollably, holding his stomach, as Sheeda landed a few paces away, her wide eyes aimed squarely at him. She cowered down, baring her teeth and claws. Most of her hair stood up straight on her head, and her tail swung wildly left to right, as James had to try his absolute best to contain his admittedly childish joy at the success of his little scare. Behind Sheeda, Curie was now entering the laboratory as well, curiously eyeing the two of them as Sheeda angrily tried to stare down James, who could still barely contain his laughter and was not paying any mind to her threatening display. Finally, somewhat getting a hold of his breathing, James exclaimed, Well, that worked much better than expected. He had indeed gotten better at sneaking up on Sheeda, who would usually hear him long before even he got close to her. What is wrong with you? Sheeda asked agitatedly, as she started to calm back down from the fright he had given her. Her head didn't actively stand up anymore and she righted herself up, dropping her threatening posture in favour of a very annoyed one. Many things, too many to list, James answered, still grinning, and made a few steps towards her. She scowled at him, holding her ground, with her posture not opening up in the slightest. Oh, come on, don't be upset, I am sorry, alright? James feigned to whine, his demeanour not allowing for a single second to think he was being genuine. It reached Sheeta by now and copied her posture, standing perfectly upright and crossing his arms, while answering her dark gaze with a smug grin, not once breaking eye contact. Curie took the opportunity, ignoring their shenanigans, and walking past the two of them to get back to work on the photometer they had disassembled earlier. For a while they stood there, staring each other down, none of them wanting to break first. But where Sheeda just kept up her stony facade, James had the advantage of being able to make faces at her. Of course this would have the absolute opposite of the intended effect, were she actually upset with him, but James felt confident in taking that gamble. And indeed, it didn't take long of him lifting his eyebrows or distorting his mouth before Sheeda could not hold it in anymore and burst out sniggering, slightly sinking forward in the process. Having lost their little struggle, she opted to instead throw a light jab at his shoulder while still laughing in the process. Your damn lucky fighting you would be more trouble than it's worth, she commented, shaking her head and taking a step towards him. I think you could probably take me if you wanted to, James replied, also stepping towards her so they could greet each other properly now that they had both calmed down. The typical greeting that had developed between them was a gesture that, to anyone watching, probably looked a lot more intimate than it actually was. Where James came from, close humans usually greeted each other with a quick hug. Where Sheeda came from, close myriads usually greeted each other by quickly rubbing either shoulders or foreheads. Combining those gestures, James and Sheeda had started putting their left hands on each other's back while quickly brushing against each other with their foreheads and right shoulders. Sheeda let out a quick chuff as they made contact, and James repeated it back to her, something he had gotten pretty good at over time. He remembered the first time he did it. Then, Sheeda broke out into a chuckle and described the sound that he had made as a Mianu with scraws. While he had no idea what either of those words meant, he guessed that it sounded quite bad. Once they were done with pleasantries, 
James moved back over to where his laptop laid on top of an empty chair, while Sheeta wandered over to one of her usual napping spots. Once she had sat down on the empty part of the lab's workspace, she curiously looked over to him, absently typing away on the keyboard. So, what are you working on? She asked, half interested, while staring at the quietly humming Earth device. Mm, the macrophases and dendrantic cells seem to have some trouble with presenting some antigen parts that don't have any similar structures to those that also evolved on Earth. James explained his current task without looking up from his screen, his fingers never stopping to input different data or commands into the computer. I'll probably have to write some genetic codes or more broadly binding protein complexes for them before I can test how well the lymphocytes actually handle alien pathogens. Of course, he knew that Shida would most likely understand almost nothing of what he just explained, but he would rather confuse than patronize her. Shida just chuckled and, apparently reacting to the one part she actually understood, replied, To what point has my life gotten that you saying something like this doesn't shock me anymore? James politely chuckled back, while still staring down at his work. His mind wasn't exactly in it, however. It was occupied with a very different problem from proteins and lymphocytes. To his dismay, the little stunt the two partners in crime within his lab appalled earlier had brought him into a precarious situation, since he now not only knew what those two had been up to, but also that they had been found out. For only a second, he glanced away from his work and over to Curie, who had gone back to tinkering a few paces away from him. Their complex movements with way too many appendages still made his head spin, as he tried to recognize the different parts of the familiar device that they were currently handling. He sighed quietly. Curie had already had a target on their back, and now they had unknowingly been caught sneaking into their sabotage laboratory. Not easing his worries was that James almost couldn't imagine someone less prepared than Curie to face the situation that they now found themselves in. However, it wasn't actually Curie who gave him headaches right now. He didn't even have to look over to see her before his inner eye, laying sprawling on the white countertop and dozing off while listening to the white noise of him typing and Curie working. Shida indeed was a more curious case than Curie. On the surface, she had broken the rules just as much as Curie had and got busted just as bad as they did. However, James was unsure about some of the things that happened. If he was being observed by officers, the question how much Shida knew was still very much up in the air. Maybe she knew nothing, or maybe she was completely in on it. Maybe she was even the reason the two of them had been busted in the first place. On the other hand, he was in the unique position that he had, to his knowledge, remained completely undiscovered, while he knew all about their little adventure, as well as some stuff about the third observing party. This left him finding himself in a moral dilemma. He knew he had to warn Curie, that wasn't a question, but Sheeta was more difficult. There were a few scenarios he had to weigh the pros and cons of, with the two most important ones being If he told Shida and she was actually involved, he had just revealed that he was onto their little game, and therefore lost every advantage he had gained until then, possibly even without realising it right away. However, if he didn't tell Shida, and she wasn't in on it, he would just let her run blindly into whatever was in for her, now that she had been discovered. And he knew he probably wouldn't have much luck just to find that one with himself. He basically bruised his brain thinking about it. Ethics and morality hadn't ever been his strongest subjects, and he knew himself to be a bit too compassionate at times, so he actively tried to create a bias towards distrusting Shida in his mind. In the end, however, he couldn't find a negative to revealing him finding out about him being observed, nor a positive to keeping his perceived advantage strong enough that it would outweigh the negative for possibly leaving Shida to blindly stumble into a trap. This held especially true after he had time to think about it, and had come to the conclusion that the sabotage might have been an attempt on Curie's life. Once more, he sighed into the silence of the room. How had his professor put it again? You will always be the guy to pull the lever, huh? It was probably time to set things in motion, seeing as he couldn't even talk himself out of it. At least he had already prepared everything beforehand, just in case he was going to go through with it. And this would also be a good opportunity to see if he knew Shida as well as he thought he did by now. Taking his hands off his keyboard, he stretched himself, with his fingers locked above his head, releasing the tension that had been building up within him. His knuckles cracking loudly as he felt his joints loosen up. Hey, Shida? 
he said loudly, turning towards his feline friend, who had been badly pretending to be asleep for a while now, with her tail swaying over the edge of the counter, immediately giving the game away. Could you do me a favour real quick? Does it involve movement? She answers grumpily, her face not turning away from the ceiling and her eyes staying closed. James looked back to his work and started to make some simple inputs once more, as he replied, There's a notebook to your right that I brought from Earth. Could you bring it over to me, please? Sheeda made an exaggerated, annoyed sound, playing up the theatrics of having to get up in order to fulfill his request. Walking over the countertops instead of getting off of them, she strolled a few steps towards the very old-fashioned stack of paper bound in brown imitation leather, while stretching extensively. And within the notebook, there was a carefully placed bookmark. While picking up the sleek object, Sheeda inspected it for a moment, and of course noted the piece of cardboard, slightly sticking out of it right away. Coming over to hand him the book, she casually opened it on the barred page, and started to read what was written there. Out of the corner of his eye, James could see it taking effect and giving Sheeta pause for a moment. He had to suppress his urge to take a closer look at her reaction, since he didn't want to give any indication to what was going on to any unwanted eyes on them right now. Was this the good or bad kind of surprise? He couldn't tell. Her pause had only lasted for a split second, presumably just enough time to take in the contents of the page. Then she immediately continued her way towards James, as if nothing had happened, and handed over the book. Don't disappoint me, please, he thought to himself, while pointlessly turning a few pages just to keep up the charade. While she was still standing next to him, he could see she had to take a sneaky look over towards his abandoned assistant, that still lay close to where Curie was working. Then he heard her take a deep breath, which she let out very slowly, before she returned to her previous position. James couldn't help but wonder if things would get easier from now on, or a lot more complicated. It was dark on board, as he followed the freak once more. Why was it so dark? Had the lights been damaged? Or maybe the generator? He couldn't worry about it now. Somehow it was harder today. There weren't many people around he could hide behind, and his target was moving a lot quicker than he usually did. He struggled to keep up, often having to neglect his cover just to not lose sight of him, and yet he still had to speed up. His visibility decreased further and further. It almost seemed like the twilight was turning into a haze or some kind of mist, obscuring his target in front of his very eyes. More and more, the ship's halls and his crewmates turned into schemes and barely recognisable forms. Yet somehow, the one thing he could still clearly see was the back of his target, even though it was moving away from him at an alarming speed. He had to catch up. Somehow, he felt that if he lost him now, he wouldn't get a chance to find him again. So he pushed on through the darkness and the mist, soon seeing nothing but his target. He was running by now, but the gap just kept getting wider and wider, even though the freak appeared to be just leisurely strolling. He pushed to the edges of his ability, sprinting with all his might just to gain any ground at all, yet it was for naught. Finally, he couldn't handle it anymore. Or had he missed some obstruction in the darkness? He didn't realise how, just that it happened. Something made him trip up and he hit the floor hard, as he panically stretched out his arms to catch himself or somehow break his momentum. Luckily, he had not seriously injured or hurt himself, he found as he inspected himself, while pushing himself up from the floor. He was so glad that he forgot for a second. Then it came back to him. Oh no, the target! He realised, shocked, and immediately his eyes shot up to where he had last seen it walk on into the darkness. The second he did, his blood froze within his veins. Looking up, he was staring right into the seemingly endless abyss of two dark orbs, deep as the void itself, staring right back at him, piercing him with their gaze. And with a high-pitched startled sound, he woke up. Officer Reprick breathed heavily as he almost threw himself out of his bed, quickly glancing around his entire room alarmedly. It was dark, but everything seemed to be where it was supposed to be. Calming his erratic breathing, he ordered the lights in the room on, blinking for a few seconds as his order was heeded and the artificial lights blinded him. The large grey chest with most of his belongings still stood in front of the left wall. His desk was still to his right and cluttered as always. 
the big mechanical door to his room was still shut tight. The white tiles on the floor and ceiling also were the same as always. Slowly, his racing heart calmed down. It had just been a dream. He slumped back down on his bed, nervously licking his trunk and fidgeting with his hands. Just a dream, he kept telling himself. It was just a dream. He probably had to admit it to himself. The close encounter with the human a while ago hadn't done any favours to his psyche. If he was going to keep having dreams like that, maybe he should swear off actual sleep, at least for a while. Still a bit jittery, he looked up above his head towards the big red letters indicating the time. It was just about the fifth hour. He had slept pretty long. Quickly, he grabbed his assistant off his nightstand with a somewhat foreboding feeling, but no new messages had arrived for him in the meantime. It seemed like the freak had decided to be good for a change, since he hadn't made any more problems for some time now. With his mood now slightly better, he got up from the bed once more and put on his identifier. While doing so, he could feel his stomach growling. It was high time to eat something. But looking over at the door, apprehension crept up on him. The nightmare still hadn't left him entirely, and he could feel himself tremble. Maybe he should shoot Haifati a message. It had been a while since they had eaten together, after all, and having someone around would probably calm his nerves a bit. Quickly, he wrote up an invitation and sent it out before being on his way. While traversing the ship, he kept an eye for everything that may be amiss. Not since his childhood had he perceived the world around him to be such a hostile and dangerous place. The typical myriad of crew members that would usually fly by him unnoticed now suddenly presented a bunch of possible threats, or even worse, hiding spots concealing unseen, more dangerous threats from him. Even though Reprieg had never in his life been hunted, the instincts ingrained into him by his ancestry didn't take too kindly to having suddenly been directly confronted by one of the galaxy's deadliest predators. Not helping with this was the fact that, had the freak actually been there to confront him that day, he could have kissed not only his job, but likely also his health goodbye. How could he have guessed that the guy was just dumb enough to walk up to the completely wrong cabin? As if Reprick had needed any more reasons to lose respect of this supposedly great creature, who appeared to be comically inane in his best of times. Of course, even though he regarded the deaf world monkey about in the same way he would an annoying brat, Reprieve still had to admit that, stuck within his primal gaze, he had felt the true nature of his admittedly mighty people shining through, rendering him feeling utterly defenceless. Too bad that the freak himself seemed to not have the slightest clue of what greatness was resting within him, instead opting to goof around with monsters and abominations almost as bizarre as himself, just minus the heritage, most of the time. These thoughts occupied Reprieve enough that he reached his destination without his anxiety rising any further. Yet, his new surroundings gave him pause. His stomach suddenly felt the need to inform him that, no matter how hungry he was, he felt not ready for a possible close encounter with his target. And as long as the freak would be wearing his assistant, he would not be informed about his whereabouts, which usually wouldn't be a problem, except that the Herbivore Casino was one of the places where one would reasonably expect to accidentally run into a crew member of a similar enough diet. Of course, the chance was low, but it was just high enough to make Reprieve consider his options. The metal door stood before him, patiently awaiting to be opened. Since it was in the middle of a shift, everything was hauntly empty, at least if compared to the usual business of this area. For a moment, Reprieve seriously considered turning around, but then he decided that that would be the first step to insanity. He couldn't let a possible encounter that wouldn't even have any real repercussions if it happened, dictate his actions. So he ordered the door to open. Immediately, he scanned all the lines forming in front of the different counters, as well as the people sitting on and at the different tables. To his relief, he didn't spot any cloth-clad figures or naked faces around. Yet he still kept an eye on everyone the entire time he was picking out his food, and a suitable table to eat, not just to see if he had missed anything, but also out of a deeply rooted instinct telling him that the reaction of other nearby prey items would warn him about incoming predators. This, of course, was hardly applicable in this situation, because neither was anybody actually in danger, nor would anyone react to the freak arriving at the scene with more than a curious glance. Anyway, this would most likely go down as the most stressful meal of his career. 
A sudden metal clanking next to him not only made him jump, but nearly sent him flying half across the table. As his legs spasmed hard in an escape reflex, there was second to none in that moment. As his heart pumped so hard that each beat threatened to choke him, an amused, vibracious sound filled the air. Are you trying to give me a heart attack? Reprieve asked with a quivering voice, while slowly crawling back to his previous position and staring at the new arrival. Hyphety, who was still making that weird, almost string instrument like sound her species expressed amusement with, turned her head side to side, taking in his appearance with her bright, striking blue eyes, just one of which nearly had the diameter of Reprieve's entire face. Her eyes were the only visible thing on her face, the rest of her theoretical features being concealed under a thick plate of ivory-like material. The same material also covered the rest of her very tall, lean body, only being broken up and segmented around her joints and orifices. But where it was smooth on her face, it showed a texture of deep bridges and long protrusions of the rest of her body, giving her slender figure an appearance resembling a walking tree. Having apparently studied him enough, she sat down to sit at the table, the progress being complicated a bit when she had to organise the four long appendages sprouting out of each of her legs, basically forming her equivalent of feet. Now some of the many, thin, branch-like arms coming from her shoulder started to pick up some of the food items from the tray she had so rudely slammed down next to him, while some others started to cheekily wave at reprieve. Her pupils, only visible as a blot of slightly less bright blue in the middle of her eyes, slightly contricted in amusement as she replied, Now, now, what in all the galaxy could have gotten you so jumpy? Reprieve, who had finally retaken his place on the table, scoffed at that. You know the answer to that, he replied, while also picking up some food. The volume of that amused string tone increased as Hyafi swayed around a bit. She pushed some food in an unseen mouth somewhere between her chin and her neck and chewed for a moment before she responded once more. Oh, come now. You don't mean to tell me that our mighty Death Worlder is getting this concerned just for encountering one of his kind, do you? She said mockingly. The high, melodic tone of her voice changing like music with every word. With a heavy exhale, Reprieg released an upset sound. Please, do not compare me to those beasts. Just because my planet has a little stronger gravity than yours, he reprimanded his colleague, throwing her the darkest class he could muster at the moment. Hyphati's head once again swayed around for a second, as her amused tone slowly faded out. Her eyes were no longer showing her amusement, instead becoming unreadably placid. Well, I kind of have to, she finally explained, her melodical tone now being replaced by a high, monotonous tone. After all, it is one of the reasons you were chosen for this assignment. There were lots of more important reasons for that. Also, Reprieve didn't quite feel like explaining how there was a world of difference between different planets designated as Death Worlds, so he decided to change the topic. Before he did, he once more scanned the room, making sure the situation had not changed. Once he was satisfied with his perceived security, he decided to inquire about the target, since he had already come up by now. Speaking of whom, it seems that he has decided to behave for a change. Has anything changed about his status that I have not been informed about? Hyphati raised one of her many arms to rub along her faceplate, as if she was pondering the question. No, not really, she finally answered, and raised some more of her arms in a dismissive gesture. Just the usual. He does seem to remember to take his assistant along most of the time now, however... That much was true. After all, Reprieve hadn't had to be called in for quite a while now, but still... The order in which events had taken place didn't sit quite right with him. What about the other ones? He asked while distractedly chewing on a long, sweet root. The monster and the abomination. What happened with them? Hyphati's eyes narrowed down on him, and he was pretty sure it wasn't an amusement this time. I thought they weren't your concern, she said sharply, making it transparent that she was very much still upset about that incident. Reprieve couldn't count how many times he already had to apologise for that, but it seemed like the trend wasn't going to end any time soon with that resentful woman. I already told you, I am sorry for that, 
Reprieve started his usual spiel once again. It was a very stressful day, and I was very preoccupied with my own duties, but I still should have been nicer about it. One would expect that making him apologise over and over again would get stale sooner or later, but one would be wrong. The melodic tones of amusement filled the air once more, as Haifati made it clear that she was very happy with herself before she answered. Fine. I guess I won't be like that then. She took up a more thoughtful expression and leaned forward onto the table, supporting her massive head with four of her arms while staring into space dreamily. Although, there isn't that much to tell you. Whatever they did in that wreck, it seems like it wasn't all too interesting. I don't know the exact details, but it was reviewed and apparently deemed to not be a problem. Therefore, it was decided to keep it on a need-to-know basis for now, in order to not raise suspicion. After all, we don't really have a good explanation for how we know about it. But from now on, Sheeda is apparently under surveillance too. Reprieve scoffed. It didn't sit right with him that an officer of all people would escape punishment for clearly disregarding orders. But it was true that it would be hard to punish someone for something that you officially didn't and couldn't know about. However, that also wasn't what he had been after with his question. And the target? He pried further, putting down his food and looking directly at his colleague. She, however, seemed to just wave it off. Seems to be none the wiser, she answered dismissively. They never told him about it, and their interactions with each other don't seem to have changed, so our best guess is that they operate completely separate from him. That was a bit hard to believe, found Reprieg. The three of them seem to be completely inseparable, so would they really keep something like this a secret from each other? On the other hand, they were talking about some of the galaxy's greatest weirdos, so it wasn't unthinkable that they acted incomprehensibly to normal people. Anyway, if he didn't know about it, then that event most likely wasn't what triggered his sudden change in behaviour, even if the timing seemed to align a little too well. Had he, in the end, really just gotten less forgetful? It's a good thing, too. Hyphati's voice suddenly brought him back to reality, as she seemed to continue her previous thought. I mean, can you imagine if he was actually with them? Bad enough that he seems to have taken a liking to them, but helping them sneak past security? Good luck bearing that news to the higher-ups. That comment confused Reprieg. Wouldn't it be our job to do exactly that? He asked warily, propping himself up a bit higher to get more on eye level, of the huge woman. Hyphody gave him a look that would be more befitting of a teacher scrutinizing a young student than a colleague regarding one of equal rank. Clearly he had just said something very foolish, although he could not figure out what it was. Her unmoving mask of her face slowly moved towards his, and she suddenly kept eye contact with him in a way that reminded him an uncomfortable lot of the way predators usually fixated people while talking to them. He now was forced to focus on her, the ambient noise of the crew members surrounding the two of them slowly fading into obscurity, leaving his mind in an eerie silence while he could do nothing but wait for her to raise her voice again. Of course, that would be our job, she finally said, the humming tone of her voice now lowering to almost a bass sound. But even if it was my God-given duty... I still wouldn't want to be the one to have to tell them that their little pet project is going to be a lot more complicated than they originally thought. Suddenly, Reprieve became very aware about the difference in position between the two of them. While they may have been equal in rank, Hyphati was clearly a lot more informed about the nature of their mission rather than just about his contents. Usually Reprieve wasn't one to ask questions. He was content with doing his job and doing it well knowing their command would be able to do whatever was important, as long as he dutifully gave them the means to do so. Yet this just didn't make sense. Wait, if we aren't expecting him to be a problem, he spoke the one thing that was burning on his mind right now. Then, what exactly are we watching him for? Hyphati stared at him for a moment. She seemed to have to think about what he had just said, hard. However, Repreet doubted that she was pondering an answer for his question. It was more likely that she thought about whether to answer him or not. Say, Reprieve, do you know who he is? 
was what she decided to reply in the end. Of course, he knew his target. You mean apart from a freak of nature? He derided the question, thinking that she was trying to somehow dismiss his concern. Haifati took a deep breath and shook her massive head. But he is exactly that, in more ways than you might think of right now. She responded seriously, her tone shutting down his apparently misguided attempt at defiance. But what did she mean? Reprieve took a long breath and exhaled slowly, before simply saying, Elaborate. Haifati leaned back, causing her enormous form to tower over him in the process, and put on a bit of a more sympathetic tone. I don't know if you realise this yet. She started what was probably going to be more of an actual explanation this time. But that freak, as you insist on calling him, is one of, if not the, first human living and employed on an entirely communal vessel. And humans, as I'm sure I don't have to remind you, belong to the Honoured Order of Primates, which in and of itself demands respect. She let that statement sink in for a moment, as if she had just said something dramatic. However, as she had said herself, this wasn't news, so Pri just looked up at her, perplexed. Yet, indeed, she continued. They are, as you so concisely put it, freaks of nature. They became omnivores. They evolved into hunters. Over millennia, their unforgiving home planet molded them into apex beings, on one level with some of the galaxy's deadliest beasts. They are no less capable than any other death world predator in the community, and for many, they give off the same suffocating air of menace when around them. Their sheer presence is often enough to make many people rethink any action they take, as you have experienced for yourself. But, even despite all that, they are still primates. In the end, they still belong to one of the most respected orders in the galaxy. And before all, that is what makes them so important. Reprieve had to say, Hyphity sure was good at flattering humans but he couldn't help but feel that she had gone off topic a bit. By now, his anxiety had subsided, and he wasn't paying any attention to their surroundings anymore. His focus was completely consumed by their conversation, bizarre as it may be. That's all very interesting, really, he responded to her little speech. But I don't see what it has to do with us observing a single human scientist on board. Once more, Hyphity just shook her head. Reprigan was started to feel embarrassed at how often he had to ask something that seemed blatantly obvious to her, even though it was due to no fault of his own. Call it an investigation, she said almost solemnly. Or better, an experiment, on a small scale. Just a test for things to come. An experiment? About what? More thinking aloud than actually trying to say something, he mumbled. Well, if it's an experiment, they can't be too happy with how it's going. To that, Hyverty let out an amused strum. Probably not. She agreed with him, and now started to pick at her food again. But we'll only know for sure once we get back into comm range. Relieved that the perceived gap between the two of them seemed to have closed at least a bit, Reprieg also let out some amused sounds. After they were done with their laughing session, Repree got ready to try and get some more information out of his co-worker, now that the tension seemed to have cleared a bit, but he wouldn't get the chance. Piercing, beeping noises simultaneously ran out from their wrists, making them slightly flinch. Immediately they got to work, answering their ringing assistance in a practice manner. In the end, good things never quite seemed to last, and apparently, the time of the freak being good and quiet was over now. At least when he had not decided to go crazy earlier when Reprieve would have still been frozen in fear due to his nightmare. Now it was merely the typical annoyance he felt from having to be called in when he answered the call from whoever was currently sitting in the operator's chair, with a grumpy but quiet, All right, where is he this time? The voice that came out of the device on his wrist was Tessiel's, and his distress clearly indicated that the young man was a good bit out of his death. Um, he's in his room, I think. The officer answered nervously, in a tone very unbefitting of his position. Not that Reprieve was in any position to judge him for that right now. He didn't notice in the moment, but while he was getting agitated, 
the air around him was slowly filled by a melodious tone. What do you mean, you think? He asked in an indignant half-whisper, while he started to get up in order to quickly make his way to this new assignment. I mean, I don't know for sure, Tessiel answered, apparently too agitated to even dignify Reprieve's tone of voice. I don't think he's left, but I can't say for sure. He's definitely not wearing his assistant, though. That was utter nonsense. Was the boy really so excited that he couldn't even properly relay the information? Nestor Aprigue, the melodic sounds got a bit louder. If he's in his room, then you shouldn't need him to wear his assistant to tell me what's going on. Aprigue reminded the rookie before calming himself. Come now, Tessiel. Take a deep breath and tell me what the situation is. You can actually hear the young man heavily breathe in and out on the other side of the line. However, even after that, the only thing he could respond was, It's hard to explain. Honestly, I don't know what to tell you. Refrig was just about to tear into Tessiel once more, when his thoughts were interrupted by him finally noticing that insisting sound in the air that had by now swollen into a bizarre melody. Would you tell me what is so funny to you? He asked, turning towards Hyphati, who was apparently exceedingly amused by something about the situation. The address slightly bowed down towards him, slowly lowering her own assistant, which she had taken off her wrist to his level while saying, I think you might want to take a look at this. All the while she was emanating that amused string tone. A bit taken aback, Reprieve reached out and took the device, which was much more massive than his own, and felt more like a slightly smaller computer screen to him. On it, he saw a currently paused video which he recognised to be footage from the camera built into the screen in the target's room. The frozen frame showed a motion blurred picture of what appeared to be the freak and the monster, standing on the near side of the bed and both holding onto a currently unrecognisable dark object with both hands. Confused, Reprieve looked back up at his still strumming colleague, who indicated to him with a gesture that he should play the footage. Not sure what to make of this, he pressed on the screen causing the frozen picture to come back to life. In motion, everything looked much better, and he could clearly make out the actions of the two in the video now. He still didn't exactly know what the item in their hands was, but it did seem to be made of two dark, most likely metal discs, and a much lighter reflective rod connecting them. Since the audio was deactivated, he did not make out anything that was said, but reading their expressions with the little bit of experience he had gained in doing so from watching the human for so long. He seemed to be mostly amused, with his moves slightly swinging towards annoyance, while she looked about as impish as it gets. After a while, Namiya started to not just pull on the weird thing, but basically hand herself onto it with her body weight, letting herself slump to the ground while holding onto it tightly. The human on the other hand was half-heartedly trying to wrangle the thing out of her grasp, while also having to basically hold both of them upright. For a moment they were locked in this bizarre wrestling match, all the while he was moving the metal rod left to right, trying to get it away from the clinging woman. And to his own detriment, he suddenly succeeded. Without any warning, the monster's grip suddenly slipped while the freak was yanking the thing in the direction of the screen. With a fall that probably startled her more than it hurt, she heavily landed on her rear. More importantly, however, was what happened on the other side of their little struggle. Because probably surprising himself more than anyone else, the force with which the human had up until now lifted not only the item, but also almost the entire weight of the woman, now had to go somewhere. And in a fairly impressive show of strength, the thing flew upwards, where probably in surprise the man's grip also loosened, sending the most likely heavy metal item flying through the air like it was a paper plane, right towards the screen. The last picture that the camera had been able to send showed the item only a finger's width away from the screen, with the people in the background just as he grasped the air behind it with shocked expressions. Reprieve couldn't help but snort at that, as he slowly handed the assistant back to his owner. I'm telling you, he said exhaustedly while shaking his head, the galaxy's deadliest toddler. <laughs>